So we're starting a new series today, new series, new year, new month, and this is one that really the Lord was imprinting on me back in September, October, but have you ever observed the life of Jesus and wondered, you know, I'm supposed to follow Jesus, be a follower of Jesus, being a Christian means a little Christ, a follower of Christ, how, how did he do it all? How did he go from place to place, all those places, speaking to all those people, investing so much in his own disciples, knowing all the while they were all going to run away from him and betray him, and yet he still invested, and yet he still healed, and yet he still taught in countless ways all over the place. One of his closest disciples, John, wrote this in John chapter 21, verse 25, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So what we have in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is a glimpse into the couple of years that Jesus walked the earth physically. And yet John says there, if we wrote down everything Jesus did just in those couple of years, the world could not contain the books of everything he did. And yet, if you really think about it, for a couple years, Jesus walked around and did what he did, but reading the Gospels, Jesus never ran anywhere. Even if you look at, you know, know, like Mark and Luke, uh, uh, who it seems like Jesus moves fairly quickly, they never say Jesus hurried anywhere. And they never say Jesus was busy anytime. They never say that Jesus had, had, had too much on his plate for one day. Do you ever find that in your day you say, I'm not hurried? Or do you ever end up saying, I, I, I got to hurry. We got to hurry and get out the door. We were supposed to be out the door five minutes ago. We got to hurry and get there. We got to hurry and do that. You, you're slowing me down. We got to hurry and hurry and hurry and get it done. So do you find yourself not hurried or hurried more of the time? Who's, who's, who's more hurried? Or at least in your mind, you feel that way sometimes, right? You feel the pressure of got to hurry and got to do it and got to be there. But we look at the life of Jesus. How was he able to accomplish more than any of us in our entire lives in just a couple of years? And yet never be hurried, be constantly interrupted, be surrounded by people who were trying to talk him out of what he was doing, and oftentimes be hunted. You can say, well, obviously he was God, and so, I mean, he was able to pull off all of those things. But by coming to this earth and, and, and being human, though he was fully God, being human, he intentionally constrained himself to our time, a 24-hour period in a day, time that he created. He put himself in the middle of it, and yet he was still able to accomplish in a couple of years, more than any of us in all of his life, and yet never be hurried. And so that's what this series is about. It's called The Way of Jesus. What we're going to look at over the next few weeks is what is the way of Jesus? How can we follow the way of Jesus? How can we do what Jesus did? How can we accomplish what Jesus accomplished? You know, Scripture talks about the way of Jesus. It talks about it uh, in Acts chapter 18, the way of the Lord. Uh, Acts chapter 16, it's called the way of salvation. Acts chapter 18, it's the way of God, the way of truth in 2 Peter, the way of righteousness later on in that same chapter in 2 Peter chapter 2. You see, Jesus said in John chapter 14 verse 6 that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So the way that he's talking about there in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that is the way of salvation. That is the way to eternal life. That is the way to eternal life. But then you think about it, in John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus said that eternal life begins when we believe in him. So if eternal life begins when we believe in him, and he is the way to eternal life, then how can we function in the way of Jesus now? Because if if I'm a believer in Jesus, according to Jesus in John 17, I am right now living the eternal life. And yet, would I say that my decisions and 
my day-to-day and my thought processes and my hurriedness line up with the eternal life that I have been gifted? Would you? You see, the way of Jesus changes who we are and how we function. How can we walk in the way of Jesus? Is it even possible to walk in the way of Jesus? I mean, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, be holy because I am holy. Are you, would you call yourself holy? If you are, we need to have a conversation about you. <laughs> yeah, if from the perspective of God, yes, we are. We've been, our sins have been paid for. But we don't often act like it. We don't often live like it. But this is one of those commands. Walking in the way of Jesus in this way, is it something that is possible for us humans, us who are not also divine? Is it possible for us to walk in the way of Jesus and function on this planet in an unhurried life? In, in, a, in a way that is steady and purpose-filled and yet can accomplish far more than we think we can when we load up our to-do list with 15 things and we're only able to do two of them. Can we still be who God designed us to be in the midst of that? There was a guy, a pastor up in the Pacific Northwest um, who wrote a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's a great phrase. That he he, he, he asked his mentor one time, how can I function? How can I accomplish something? And that's something his mentor told him. You have to ruthlessly eliminate hurry. That's the only way you're going to survive. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry. And so I have to understand that I'm going to try to accomplish what Jesus has for me. I'm going to try to live the way of Jesus. But you have to understand, I'm still trying to figure this out. I haven't mastered this process at all. So I'm working it out as I'm teaching it to y'all right now. Uh, and we're, over the next few weeks, we're, we're, we're trying, we're going to walk through this deal together. You know, actually, I mean, as a church, going through this Daniel fast, I mean, Jesus himself fasted. So following the way of Jesus is building in spiritual disciplines similar to that as well. And we're going to do our best to come out better on the other end. So the way of Jesus. What will the way of Jesus bring about in our lives? Now this way that the Lord has for us isn't really a new idea, a new concept. It's actually introduced back, uh, you know, long past, all the way back in the book of Genesis when God creates the Sabbath. But then the prophet Jeremiah speaks of it as well. Jeremiah chapter 6 says, thus says the Lord, ask where the good way is. And walk in it and find rest for your souls. So look at that. There he says, stand by the roads, look, and ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. You will find soul rest when you walk in the way, the good way when you walk in it. There's lots of ways we can walk in. There's lots of options we can do. Lots of decisions we can make that may not be the good way. That may not be the way of Jesus, but we choose them often anyway. But only in this good way, we see there that God says there in Jeremiah chapter 6, only in the good way will we find rest for our soul. Soul rest. Soul rest. You know, living in this world is often burdensome and anxiety-inducing, painful and heavy sometimes. But... Jesus offers us a better way to live through it. And the words here in Jeremiah chapter 6 are very similar to the words Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 11. That's where we're going to spend the rest of our time. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28. It's almost identical language to what God used there in Jeremiah chapter 6. Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, soul rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, we've heard that passage before if you've been in church for very long. Maybe if you haven't even been in church ever, you've heard that. 
You know, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. You see, this is following the way of Jesus. This is what the way of Jesus is. Come to Jesus and experience this soul rest. The way of Jesus is really, it's a lifestyle change. It's a lifestyle change, a lifestyle decision. Because what we see there, the soul rest, I mean, life with Jesus, walking in the way of Jesus, life with Jesus is rest-filled, is restful, is restful. It's filled with soul rest. But then how is it, if life with Jesus is restful, soul restful, how is it then that me, as a believer, I have Jesus, but my soul isn't often at rest? Do y'all ever find your soul's not at rest? You ever find that? Maybe it's your mind that's not at rest. Maybe it's your heart's not at rest. Maybe you're constantly thinking about something, constantly anxious about something, constantly scrolling through your news feed and it gets your blood pressure up. Or you got financial things or health things or political things or, you know, a, a world event things going on. And it just, you, you can't be at peace. But what Jesus says there in that passage Come to me, and I will give you rest. If you take my yoke upon you and learn from me, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So how, how is it then that I have Jesus but not rest? Maybe it's when I find myself feeling anxious and find myself in worry and find myself in these runaway thoughts, maybe it's that I'm not looking to Jesus, I'm not coming to Jesus, rather I'm coming to myself and my own perception of my situation and my reality and my experience and circumstance. See, lack of soul rest that God spoke about in Jeremiah, that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 11, that God introduced by creating the Sabbath. Lack of soul rest comes from a lack of trust. It really comes from the, doing the opposite of what Jesus said there, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me. When we don't come to Jesus, we don't find rest. We might be able to find a cheap imitation of rest, but it's not soul rest. A lack of soul rest comes from not coming to Jesus. A lack of soul rest comes from not coming to Jesus. Soul rest comes from following the way of Jesus and learning from him, his way of life, as he says there in that passage. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. And yet, we all feel as though from time to time we're laboring. Like he says there, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. We feel like we're laden down with heavy things. If not all the time, at least periodically, we feel this, this weight in the depths of our spirit sometimes and and we can't shake it you know that word labor there that he uses in verse 28 come to me all who labor and are heavy laden the word labor means to work to exhaustion to the point of not being able to pick up your arms anymore not being able to to function anymore you know there's a passage in the old testament it talks about i believe it's david and another guy are fighting off enemies and they're the only two guys left in this area fighting off enemies and they fight with such veracity and intensity that the muscles of their hands seize so that when the battle's over they can't let their swords go because they've been gripping it so tight for so long and they can't let go even though they, they're so exhausted they can't even lift their arms anymore they just cannot release the swords so that word there labor means to work to exhaustion I mean not just tired but just completely and utterly exhausted. You just don't even have the mental capacity to think about anything other than shutting your eyes and going to sleep. And so Jesus says there, if, you're labor, if you labor to exhaustion, if you're heavy laden, you got these weights on you. He says, come to me and I will give you, what's that word? Rest. But what's the thing he says next to do? He says, take my yoke upon you. Now, I never really thought about it in depth before, but... He says, I will give you rest, but then he says, take my yoke upon you. And the yoke is a tool of work. So he says, I will give you rest, but I will give you a new tool to work with. He doesn't say take time off of work. He says, I will give you a new way to work. How can, how can a tool of work provide soul rest? 
I mean, it, what we're talking about in this whole passage is soul rest. It, it's a new way of life. But he says, don't just take time off. I will give you a new tool to work with. Now, again, I, I can't read your mind, but oftentimes the way I think of rest and have often thought that way, I mean, think of rest as like sleep. Think of rest as like vacation. Um, think of, of rest as just vegging on the couch and, 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 and binging. Just, I just need a brain break from everything and put on something mindless. I just need to, to uh, have, a, have a refresh. But really, those type of things are, are more of a reprieve, a, a break from the worries and anxieties. It's, it's not restful. Because then we go right back to the habits, we go right back to the thoughts, we go right back to the, to the things that brought us the anxiety, the things that brought us the struggle, and we haven't changed any kind of perspective, we haven't changed anything, we just dive right back in. And so everything that we were just resting from comes bombarding, us, uh, comes bombarding back to us, and we're right back in the thick of the anxiety and the struggle and, and the difficulty, and we are again in the labor and the heavy ladenness of this life. And so there has to be a difference somewhere in what Jesus is saying and how we often pursue rest. Am I alone in this? Do you ever, when you go back to what you were doing before you rested, do you ever feel overwhelmed? Like, say for instance, kids, I don't want to, you know, discourage you. School starts tomorrow. Parents, do you think when the kids get home tomorrow afternoon, evening, they're going to be pretty tired? <laughs> Jumping right back in the deep end after having two weeks of easygoing, fun, experience. I mean, I asked every kid in the room that I shook a hand with this morning, you ready for school to, to start back? Only Two of them did say yes. And some of your parents are like, What? Ask me afterwards, I'll tell you if it was your kid or not. Now, two of them did say yes, but it, 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 it's like a, you, or when, when you go back to work after, you know, taking time off, vacation, you take your kids, it's not a vacation, but taking some time off, I mean, it's like getting, you just like a slog, like, oh, I just can't get back in the groove here, because it's, it's recreating the same thing that we were trying to unload before. And so what Jesus is trying to introduce is an entirely new paradigm, an entirely new concept. Maybe this idea of rest isn't simply sitting still and doing nothing. Maybe soul rest can be had in the midst of overwhelming schedules. Maybe soul rest can still be had when life is nonstop. Maybe soul rest can still be had when, a, when the anxieties of this world and your particular circumstance would buckle you at the knees in any other way. Maybe soul rest can still be had in the middle of all that stuff. But how? I mean, he says, take my yoke upon you. And so the implication there is, is that we're trying to function in this life outside of Jesus. We may have Jesus, we believe in Jesus, but when he says, come to me and take my yoke, that means we're trying to do it under our own strength. We're trying to do it under our own yoke. The, the yoke, you know, the, the piece of wood that connects two animals as they plow the field. We're trying to do it under our own strength. The, the idea is we have built our own yoke and have our own method to plow the field. We have devised our own way to accomplish this. Maybe we've done it year after year after year. And so we feel like we've got you know, some, some semblance of, of a routine. And uh, we, we, we've almost got muscle memory and rote in how we accomplish this. But Jesus is telling us, yeah, you're doing it all wrong. Jesus offers us better equipment. So here in this passage in Matthew 11, Jesus is talking about something completely different from merely taking a break. He's talking about a different life. The way of Jesus is a completely different way of life than that to which we become accustomed. So we have to come to Jesus and adopt his way of life. Because life has difficulties, life has problems, but the way of life can be easy with Jesus. 
You know, sometimes we look at our lives and it doesn't really line up with what Jesus says there in verse 30. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Anybody have an easy life? If you examine your entire life from birth until now, everything has been easy for you. Perfect in every way. Yeah, yeah. No sarcasm at all, right, Mary? It's, no. But Jesus says it can be. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Coming to Jesus can bring us an easy way of life. In the middle of difficulties, in the middle of problems, in the middle of afflictions, in the middle of, uh, of something uh, somebody else did that we're dealing with the ramifications of, coming to Jesus can show us a new way. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says it like this. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. So even though we get hit, even though we get struck down, even though we get persecuted, we're not alone. We're not destroyed. We're still moving forward. In the middle of experiencing all those difficulties and, and as Paul says, afflictions and crushings, we don't have despair because we have Jesus. We don't have destruction because we have Jesus. We have taken his yoke, and the idea, remember I told you earlier what the yoke is, it, it, it's a piece of equipment that connects some animals so you can do the plowing. He says, take my yoke upon you. And so the idea is, you are attached to Jesus, plowing the field of your life for him to sow the seeds of his word in you. You're not plowing alone when you're yoked to Jesus, not even in pieces. When you're attached to Jesus, he's plowing with you. Sometimes he's pulling you the whole way, but he's going to be with you and never leave you alone. Take his yoke upon you and learn from him. But it begins with coming to Jesus. And so we can still have soul rest in the middle of life's burdens when we come to Jesus. We can still have soul rest when everything is, is, is going crazy, when nothing makes sense, when, when we're dealing with the fallout of, of stuff maybe we have done in the past or stuff other people have done to us, when we're dealing with it, we can still have soul rest when we come to Jesus. When we don't come to ourselves, we, when we don't come to somebody else and get their opinion without getting Jesus' opinion first, when, when we uh, absorb what the world has told us, what, what our experience tells us, what, how the, the, the habits of our lives tell us to do certain things, rather we should come to Jesus and allow him to guide us through the process. That doesn't mean everything is going to be hunky-dory. It's still going to be difficult, but when we're with Jesus, our perspective completely changes. That's how Jesus was able to walk that path. That's how Jesus was able to kneel down and wash the feet of his disciples, knowing in a couple of hours every single one of them was going to run from him, abandon him, betray him. But Jesus still washed their feet, knowing that was coming, because he had soul rest in following the way of the Lord, even with what's coming, even with what he's experiencing. Even Jesus, dying on the cross, was so at peace in where he was, he shared the gospel with the guy next to him. He asked for forgiveness for the guys nailing him to the cross. I don't know about you, but I'm not thinking about the souls of the guy nailing me to the cross when I'm being nailed to the cross. But Jesus had soul rest in the middle of that moment. And because he was in the way of the Lord. It's possible in our lives. Jesus doesn't give us instructions if it's not possible. He doesn't. If it cannot be accomplished, he's not going to tell us to do it. And so he gives us this instruction, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so that's the challenge then, come to Jesus. 
Will you come to Jesus today? Maybe for the first time. Maybe for the thousandth time. Will you come to Jesus in whatever capacity you find yourself, in whatever burdens, in whatever worries, in whatever difficulties, will you come to Jesus? Come to Jesus in, in, in investing more in Scripture. Come to Jesus in investing more in prayer. Come to Jesus in your conversations with the people around you. Come to Jesus in reconfiguring your mindset so that your gut reaction isn't a negative comment or isn't to blow up or isn't, maybe your gut reaction no longer will become frustration when something doesn't go your way. Maybe you'll be the voice of peace in the midst of chaos when you come to Jesus now. It's laying the groundwork for what Jesus is going to do through you. And so in your life, ask yourself the question right now. Ask yourself the question, do I have soul rest? in everywhere, in every part of my life. Every part. With my job, with my kids, with my grandkids, with my neighbors, with my family. Do I have soul rest in all of it? Is my life perfection? And if not, maybe there's something, some way we can come to Jesus and take his yoke on us and begin to learn from how he did things. Maybe we need to slow down a little bit and cut out some hurry. Maybe we don't need to speed walk through Walmart because there's somebody on the next dial reaching for macaroni. When you're reaching for macaroni, who needs Jesus? And this conversation will be started. Maybe Facebook doesn't need your eyeballs five hours a day. What needs to be ruthlessly eliminated for you to find the way of Jesus now in your spirit, in your heart? So that when you walk out these doors here in just a few moments, you can be the voice of Jesus in somebody's life. Maybe there's somebody in this room that Jesus put you here today to have an interaction with, and you didn't even know it. Somebody you've never actually talked to before. But there's one comment that you're going to mention to them that will carry them this week. Because you're walking in the way of Jesus. Walking in the way of Jesus. Because when you walk in the way of Jesus, you will be afflicted in every way but not crushed. Perplexed but not driven to despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. You'll be struck down but not destroyed. Do you want soul rest? Will you follow the way of Jesus and learn from him in everything he does, every interaction he has? And then, quite possibly, maybe your life will mirror his. And the world wouldn't be able to contain the books because of all you were able to accomplish as you followed the way of Jesus. Y'all pray with me. God, we often take our own advice before we take yours. Listen to ourselves before listening to your word. We follow our own way and our own plan and our own determinations. Because experience tells us that's the best way. And yet we find our lives lined with anxiety. We find our past strewn with the bodies of those people we've run over in the process of getting to where we are. Help us to be in the moment. To cut out hurry. 
to embrace the interruption. To walk with you. To breathe with you. God, I pray that we would find soul rest in this life by taking your yoke, your tool, your piece of equipment as we go about our day, as we go about our life, as we go about our work, our school, our conversations, our relationships. We would embrace the way of Jesus. Rather than falling on the default of what we have been taught, hustle, hustle, hustle. God, help us to be your voice in the lives of those people around us. Your influence in their lives. Help us to walk in the way of Jesus. Even as we get pulled in every other direction and our mind gets lost in chasing after the white rabbit because we often feel we're late, we're late for a very important date when we just need to be present. and show you to the people we speak with, live with, buy things from at the store. God, I pray right now if there's anyone in the room or online who has not been walking in the way of Jesus, but has felt heavy laden, exhausted, that they would come to you today, possibly for the first time. They would come to you today and believe in you, your death and resurrection. God, I pray we would all come to you, that even as followers of Christ, we would come to you and find soul rest where it has been sorely lacking of late. God, I pray that we would listen to your voice above every other one speaking into us here and now. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his way, his path, his life and the demonstration we have of his life. God, we pray you would give us the strength to walk in his footsteps through our lives. In your name I pray, amen.